It's the end of June and bucks are showing great antler development here at the Proving Grounds. This makes me very excited for the opening day of deer season, and I've been using the off season to prepare. During past years, I've shared an archery practice technique called blind bell. This is a training technique where you stand very close to the target, just far enough back that the arrow would clear the bow before reaching the target, draw back, kind of get it pointed in the center, then shut your eyes and totally focus on form. I use this technique not only to improve my form, but to help reduce target panic. I'm always looking for methods to improve my archery form and increase accuracy. Recently, a friend of mine, Mike Tanaka, shared such a technique. Most archers are familiar with paper tuning. They go to a pro shop, they buy a new bow, the guy's setting it up, shoot through the paper four or five times and send you home. But let's take that a step further. Paper tuning is not only useful for tuning equipment, it's very useful for perfecting your form. Mike has shared with me it's relatively easy to tune a bow so it shoots nice holes through paper. And the bigger issue is tuning the shooter. At most pro shops, they shoot the bow and tune the equipment and they want to make sure the arrow's not flying at close range, tail right, left, up or down. You do this at close range because if you're shooting further, the feathers, unless the bow's really out of tune, will correct the arrow flight and it would look straight when it goes through the paper. Once the bow is tuned, we need to make sure the shooter is tuned and that typically has to do with the way the bow is held to grip or how the release is placed against your face. There's a lot of pressure on the grip hand and the release hand when you're pulling back 50, 60, 70 pounds. And if that pressure is slightly left or right, up or down, it will cause the arrow to start out flying anyway, tail right, left, up or down. That's where the paper test comes in. By shooting at close range, six or seven feet back, the arrow, if it's got pressure and it's tail right, left, up or down, will show when it goes through the paper. So for this to work, the target needs to be far enough behind the paper so the arrow can pass all the way through. After the arrow's been shot, when it hits the paper, it will make a perfect bullet hole. But as it continues to slide through, if it's this way or that way or up or down, the fletching will rip the paper. You see the pattern of the fletching, whichever way the arrow's tail is oriented. Ideally, you're making what we call a bullet hole. You see a small round hole, and see where each fletching cut the paper. You can set this up at home. It's always safety first, so we've got a frame built that will hold our paper and a large morel target behind the frame. The target's as large or larger than the frame, so if I'm in between here, it's going in the target. Use a very thin paper. I use parchment paper. It's really inexpensive, and it will tell on you. It tears super easy, so it will show the slightest orientation of the arrow. The paper needs to be tight. We hold ours by a couple of clamps. If it's sloppy, you won't get a true picture of how the arrow is tearing. Another tip that makes me a little more comfortable in using this technique is make sure I've got a small crack right here so I can ensure there's a target behind there before I shoot. Don't make a tuning decision based on one shot. Shoot three or four or five, see if there's a consistent tear pattern, and if there is, then you can make an adjustment. I'll shoot a few shots to demonstrate and I'll purposely put a little pressure on one side or the other of my grip and show you what a tear looks like. And then I'll try to shoot a bullet hole. I'll start off by shooting, trying not to pay a lot of attention to my grip 
Let's see what kind of tear that produces. I took the first shot and let my face push into the string a little bit and the results are obvious. The pointed arrow went right through there. It's a nice round hole, but the arrow was flying knock left, which results in a left tear. So you can see here and here where the fletchings went through. You always see those cuts where the fletchings go through and a nice round hole where the arrow point goes through. What we want is those fletchings cutting right around that arrow hole. This shot, I'll make sure the string is clearing my face, but I'll grip the handle fairly tight. Woo! That's a lot of torque there. I often see guys shooting to have that full grip on their bow. All their fingers are wrapped around it and they're kind of holding it like someone's gonna take it out of their hand. This is often the result. The point of the arrow went in here, clean hoe, and it tore an inch and a half or more over here. You can see where the fletchings went through. So that arrow was flying at a very steep angle, making a lot of noise, obviously, and losing efficiency. Now, it would correct itself down range, but by that time, the deer's probably heard the arrow and maybe started to react. Third shot, well, I'll try to shoot with a good grip and no face pressure. That looks good, very good. Third shot, I gotta tell you, since I was doing it on camera and need to make a good hole, I kind of felt the same pressure as shooting at a big old buck, but it worked out good. So first shot was a lot of face pressure. The string was really pushing into me. Second shot, torquing with my hand, I had a death grip on it. Third shot, good grip, string's not touching my face. Got a hole right in the paper. When the bow is tuned and the shooter is tuned, to producing results like this, well that means all the energy is right behind the broadhead. You can shoot less pounds and get greater penetration. And it's gonna be a quieter arrow downrange. Less of a chance that deer's gonna drop before the arrow gets there. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Reconics, Redmond Hunt, Eagle Seed, Nikon, Winchester, Lacrosse Footwear, Flatwood Natives, Morel Targets, Hoyman, Hooks Custom Calls, Montana Decoy, Summit Tree Stands, Drake Non-Typical Clothing, RTP Outdoors, Yamaha, Fourth Arrow, Onyx Hunt, Scent Crusher, Mossy Oak Properties of the Heartland, Scorpion Venom Archery, Blood Sport Arrows, Code Blue, Decode, G5 Broadhead, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. I've learned a lot from using this technique and I will continue it throughout the summer before my regular practice sessions. I believe the instant feedback helps me reduce target panic and makes me have much better follow through. As I start shooting outside more and stepping back to further distances, I'll be sharing additional techniques. The Growing Deer summer interns, Owen, Hunter, Taylor, Patrick, and Tanner, have been doing a great job improving the habitat here at the Proving Grounds and along the way, getting some incredible experience that will help them throughout their career. A few weeks ago, they were spot treating Cerisa lespediza. This is a very invasive, exotic plant. It was brought into the United States decades ago and turned out to be a real pest. And it's a very invasive species. It's spread in places it shouldn't be. In fact, I don't think it should be anywhere. Livestock rarely browse it, Wildlife don't use it. The seeds are too small for wildlife species to consume. It's a nasty pest. It's relatively easy to control with a strong mix of glyphosate. But the problem is it makes a tremendous seed base and you end up treating it for several years in a row, killing the above ground plants, but then coming back and treating seedlings that come from the seed base the following year. They used backpack sprayers so they could limit the treatment to each spot or each plant and included a dye with the herbicide so they would know exactly where they were treating. Another big benefit of using a dye so you can see what's already been treated, especially if you return a day or two later. 
We treat Cerisa to keep it from spreading and also allow beneficial native species to grow in its place. Cerisa is rarely a problem in closed canopy forests, but that doesn't mean there's not other species that need to be controlled. We're doing a bit of TSI, timber stand improvement work today at the Proven Grounds. Today we're working on taking sassafras out of the understory of this oak forest. Sassafras can become a weed species. Remember our definition of a weed is anything growing and competing with crops that are more preferred. Sassafras typically grows or colonizes areas that had a lot of disturbance. And here in the Ozark Mountains, most of the ridge tops were tomato fields around the 30s, 40s, and maybe early 50s. Just down the ridgeway, we can see an old dozer deck or a pile where all the dirt probably in trees were dozed off these ridges to make tomato fields. They were productive for tomatoes for a few years and then left to go, and we got a big invasion of sassafras. Sassafras can grow extremely large, but rarely are they in an area that allows them to express their potential. Usually they're an understory tree like this. They're just taking up a lot of moisture and nutrients from the oaks in the area and shading out quality vegetation from growing in the understory. Fortunately, sassafras are easy to control. And today I'm working with the interns, this is Taylor, and we're using the hack and squirt method. Just like with broadleaf weeds, different trees require different herbicides. Sassafras can be terminated relatively easily by glyphosate. Taylor's been treating some trees, so I'm gonna allow him to demonstrate as I explain the hack and squirt technique. Hack and squirt's an extremely safe and efficient technique. So we simply take our hatchet, hit the tree right here, fold it down just a little bit. While my hatchet's still there, I put one squirt in for a tree this size and move on to the next. So Taylor, give me one good hack right here. And then take your squirt bottle and you're using the hatchet to filter it in, to kind of form it right into that hack. And that's all it takes. Now the beauty of using this technique is over the next month or so, this tree will be terminated, but it will be standing. You're not filling all these trees at once, making a mess. Then this winter, the small limbs will fall off and over the next year or two, the limbs up to an inch or so will fall off unless we get a lot of snow. By the time the stem falls, it will be so rotten, it's gonna hit the ground and turn into soil fairly quickly. Hack and Squirt's a simple and safe technique. One guy can cover a lot of acres in a day. A beauty of hack and squirt versus a chainsaw or something, if we cut this tree off, it would just dump sprout back. We would not terminate the tree. We'd fell the top, but the roots are still alive. This terminates the entire tree, top and roots. The bark of a sassafras is easy to identify, but if you're just starting out, it's usually easier to identify trees by their leaves. You wanna make sure you're terminating the right tree. You don't wanna accidentally hack a white oak or something that's preferred for that site. Sassafras is a bit unique in that the leaves commonly take one of three forms. So it has single lobe, double lobe, and triple lobe leaves. But the color and the triple lobes are usually the most common. They're easy to identify. I've talked way longer than it takes to terminate a tree. We're just gonna watch Taylor go through here and hack four or five trees in this area and you can see how much progress one guy with a hatchet and a squirt bottle can make. I'll share that different species of trees require different strengths or blends of glyphosate. In some species, won't be controlled very easily by glyphosate. Trees like maple usually require a different herbicide. I've used a hack and squirt technique here and on clients' properties for years, and I'm pleased with the results. Several weeks ago, I shared we calibrated our Genesis drill to plant a garden. This wasn't a typical garden. I had 20 plus different species of garden varieties. We planted directly into a standing crop of Eagle Seeds Fall Buffalo Blend. This morning, I checked on the buffalo garden and I was pleased with what I found. I'm standing in a bit of an experiment. Last year at the same location, I drilled a garden. It turned out okay, we got some produce out of it, 
but I put the rows at 15 inches instead of seven and a half. So this year, learning from that mistake, I did the same thing. I calibrated, but I didn't tape off every other row. So I planted them at seven and a half inch spacing. And as you can tell, it's plenty thick. There are very few weeds coming through from the mulch of the fall buffalo blend and that all the garden species are so close together, not a lot of sun's reaching the ground to allow weeds to grow. There's a bunch of something growing, but I gotta tell you at this stage, it's so thick and some of the squash and melons and whatnot are similar enough, I can't tell them apart. Some of the varieties are being impacted by insects and I see some yellow and black insects chewing on leaves. Others are doing great. Over time, I hope to learn which garden varieties work well in this system and which ones don't because it's much easier than going over here and tilling soil or doing something and planting each seed down a row. It's yet to be determined how productive this type of garden will be, but for not much money and seed and taking up a little space on my food plot, it's a fun experiment and we'll keep you posted as the summer progresses. I'll share that some of the varieties in here are not edible. They're not normal garden varieties. They're here to improve the soil. I have a few sunflowers in here, primarily for looks, and sunflowers make a massive root system that helps improve the soil. Hopefully in another month or so, I'll be picking produce out of this garden. If you know someone that would enjoy this information, please send them a link to the Growing Deer channel. And if you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Whether you're working in a garden or doing some wildlife habitat improvement projects, I hope you take time to get outside this week and enjoy creation. But more importantly, take time every day to slow down and listen to what the Creator is saying to you. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.